Great. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Jeremy Carl. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution. Uh, and I think it's going to be a terrific afternoon uh, discussing big tech and the future of the free and open internet. Uh, we're going to be joined by four panelists uh, right here on my right who um, represent uh, both academics, policymakers, and practitioners in the technology space. And they come to this issue from a variety of personal, professional, and ideological perspectives. And we're going to follow our panel discussion here with a speech from Senator Josh Hawley uh, of Missouri, who in his first year as a senator has already made a tremendous impact on the policy environment in this area. Um, so this is actually an issue I go back personally quite a ways on. I started using the web in 1993 uh, with the first graphical internet browser, NCSA Mosaic, uh, from the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And at the time, there were less than 100 websites in the world. Uh, and uh, I can brag about that here in DC, but in Palo Alto, where I live, uh, you can't get away from that. I was once saying that uh, to a parent of uh, w one of uh, my kid's friends. And he says, oh, yeah, I wrote the first Mac web browser. And in fact, he had. So uh, <laughs> that was a, a good lesson to me, not to get a little too big for my britches and know your audience. Um, in any case, I was subsequently involved in the growth and management of some of the first internet companies in existence. And I've been writing about and speaking about politics and the internet uh, on and off for a quarter century now. So uh, it, one of the things that's interesting is that many of the debates that we're having today were debates that we were having, although I think with different sorts of results, even a quarter century ago. Um, so I come to this debate as somebody who believes passionately in free speech and the marketplace of ideas, and I want to see that protected online. Um, but now increasingly, I think what we're seeing is a small number of tech companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, Amazon, uh, have increasing control of what we see online. Uh, and that's an irony to me that while Congress is having a debate about rules from ISPs against blocking, against throttling, uh, and I agree, by the way, that ISPs should not be able to block or throttle on ideological or, or you know, uh, uh, grounds um, these sorts of content. We're not spending time talking, uh, at least legislatively, I think we are in the public discussion to some degree, about these much bigger and more powerful players to me um, who have much stronger gatekeeper uh, status. And I think there's some real hypocrisy and double standards in that debate that need to be brought to the fore. Just as a couple of trivial examples, uh, we've had senior Mozilla employees and engineers recently accuse Google of slowing down YouTube videos or causing bugs in Gmail and Google Docs on Firefox. That benefits Google's Chrome. Uh, we've had Amazon blocking or uh, stopping Apple TV and Google's Chromecast on their website in retaliation for those companies refusing to allow Prime videos on their devices. And there are several more things that we could point to in this vein. Um, so some of our panelists today are going to talk about net neutrality as a starting point because it's been much in the news uh, and it offers a useful frame. But we're not going to be limited by that discussion because I think it's a much broader discussion as well. And I'm not saying, by the way, that I uh, am going to stand up here and say that I know that every rule that we should make, but I do believe that every rule or law that we make in this area should apply to everyone equally. And a lot of people say, well, just let the market sort it out. Um, it doesn't work like that, OK? I was a manager at an early internet company, and we won a $1 billion antitrust judgment against Microsoft for their anti-competitive actions against us. And ultimately, that was a cost of doing business for them. Uh, you know, it destroyed our market position. Uh, they were happy to pay a billion dollars. This was even 20 years ago we're talking about now. And if you allow the market to sort itself out, when the market is a functional monopoly, you just empower the monopolist. It's just that simple, guys. Um, <laughs> so that's my editorial comment. Uh, some of my friends on the right say, hey, these are private companies. But if Twitter banned Donald Trump, as it is publicly said, has the right to do, don't you think that would fundamentally impact his First Amendment rights and his ability to succeed in the political arena? I mean, to ask that question is to answer it. Uh, and I think we need to have a new conception of how we think about these things. I also have a friend who's a gay conservative who says, hey, if Masterpiece Cake Shop won't bake me a cake for my wedding, I have lots of other places I can go. But if Amazon bans my book or if Twitter deplatforms me, uh, my ability to earn a livelihood is impacted fundamentally. Uh, yet the first is protected and the second isn't. And I think that's sort of part of the structural incoherence right now that we're having in this argument. Um, so what I want to look at today is we've got the Save the Internet Act out there just passed three weeks ago in the House. That's to restore the 2015 net neutrality rules. Uh, Pelosi has criticized Senator McConnell for not taking that up, while Senator McConnell has made it equally clear that the Democrats' plans in this area, for his perspective, are a dead letter. Uh, at the same time, um, there are folks out there, thankfully, that are making free speech and, and net neutrality bipartisan issues, or at least attempting to. Senator Sinema, who actually uh, made uh, some efforts to join uh, us today, but unfortunately was not able to make it. 
uh, the new Democrat, newly elected Democrat from Arizona. She's par partnered with Senator Wicker on some possible bipartisan approaches. And we definitely have bipartisan agreement that something needs to be done with the status quo. On the right, not just Senator Hawley, but Cruz, Blackburn, Graham, Sullivan, that's a pretty bl broad coalition within the Republican caucus. And on the left, not just by Cinema, but by Elizabeth Warren, who's called for breaking up these companies. Not, I'm not necessarily going there personally, but uh, you've had all the, sort of in a more moderate vein, Senators Wyden and Booker, who've expressed issues about algorithmic bias in internet search. So there's a lot to unpack here, and let's uh, start unpacking it. I've got a terrific panel with me today. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Frank Pasquale, who's a professor of law at the University of Maryland and someone who's done a wide variety of really, really terrific writing in this area. He's going to talk about some fascinating work on platform neutrality and freedom of expression online, and he's going to elaborate to what extent this fits into the debates we're having on net neutrality. We're then going to move to Dan Huff, who spent many years as counsel for the House Judiciary Committee, and he's going to talk about, and Senate Judiciary Committee, going to talk about how antitrust issues and free speech concerns then uh, kind of um, contrast uh, to the debates we're having on net neutrality now, because I think there's some, some elements of that that don't really compute. And then I'm going to go to my Hoover friend and colleague, Adam White, also of George Mason. Adam is going to elaborate on a fascinating piece he wrote uh, in the New Atlantis uh, a couple months ago now, a few months ago, uh, called Google.gov, um, particularly kind of looking at uh, the elements of censorship and the public good and fixing search results. And we're going to see with how that squares with Google's current policy positions. Um, and then finally, we're going to, uh, batting cleanup, we're going to have Luther Lowe of Yelp, a uh, practitioner in this field. He's the SVP of public policy for Yelp and a very successful internet company that nonetheless has to compete with these monopolistic internet giants and kind of discuss uh, Yelp has had a longstanding uh, uh, support of net neutrality for ISPs over the years and how that kind of ties in in his thinking to some of the current issues that they're facing in an antitrust basis with Google, et cetera. Um, so I welcome our panelists. I'm going to ask them to please do try to stick to 10 minutes each so that we have a little time for Q&A before Senator Hawley. And uh, I appreciate everybody coming out today. And I hope we'll have a fascinating discussion. So Frank, thank you. Now at that time, you know, we still had these massive debates over network neutrality. There were a lot of concerns about uh, sort of discrimination online. And my intervention there was to say, you know, we have Google at that time was weighing in for net neutrality because the big concern there was that you could have uh, end, uh, end providers being uh, sort of discriminated against by the large ISPs, saying, you know, we really want to see non-discrimination here. And what I tried to state at that time was that we really need to think about what are the ways in which dominant uh, search engines could themselves discriminate and could themselves sort of shape commerce in ways that would be troubling because of a bottleneck effect, right? Because you just had to use this one way of getting to uh, your potential customers. And in that article, what I tried to focus on was uh, three comparisons. One being, is one saying that to the extent that you would have, for example, uh, Google being able to get favorable treatment under copyright law. Remember, now, of course, the copyright law is settled, but at the time it was quite unsettled as to how much of the web they could copy, et cetera, that people would have in uh, perpetuity uh, the level of access that they had at the time. Because uh, my worry was at that time that you know, Google was putting itself out there as potentially a entity that had uh, a public interest in, say, copying all the books in the library or copying all websites, et cetera. Um, but that that could eventually turn into more of a tiered payment model, et cetera. And that the copyright decisions that were being made at the time about unfair use were not necessarily conditioned on the further maintenance of the Google business model. The other thing that I focused on at the time was uh, trademark. Okay, so you have trademark disputes when at the time, again, these laws are settled now in Google's favor, but at the time there was a lot of concern by people that held trademarks that said, look, when you allow your, our competitors to bid on our trademarks, there's initial interest confusion, and we think that essentially it's unfair if we are not, the trademark holder is not, say, the first result on the trademark itself. Okay? And I wrote a piece called Asterisk Revisited that essentially went through that and said, we really should think seriously about potentially, say, giving the trademark holder at least an asterisk so that they cannot be entirely outbid by rivals uh, for searches on their own terms. And looking at all those laws, and there were a few other comparisons I made with respect to common carrier and saying that, you know, if you, that, uh, to the extent that Google wanted uh, an assurance that ISPs would not block or slow uh, traffic, um, that they themselves should be able to offer simultaneous assurances that they wouldn't do so for commercial reasons, and that's a very important caveat here, right? Um, and uh, these three comparisons along tra copyright, trademark, and communications law, I think could apply to 
some of these dominant search engines and later social networks and now large platforms, you know. And then the, what's been really rewarding to me has been seeing over the years the gradual uh, traction of these ideas, first abroad, you know, definitely in Europe. I've had many, you know, trips to Brussels and to other areas in Europe to talk about these things. Um, also in Asia, Australia, you know, the Australian Competition Report, now finally in the U.S. Uh, we're, I think we're catching up. Um, one of the things also that I have to note on a humorous note is, you know, I, presenting these ideas 10 years ago or so, it was, it was a really lonely business. Um, there were a lot of folks at the time that just thought, this is bizarre, the comparisons don't work. Um, I remember I had one presentation where someone who's a very high level person in corporate law took my paper, you know, the one I was just describing, the Internet Non-Discrimination Principles, threw it on the table and said, this is not legal scholarship. In five years, no one will have heard of Google. They'll be off the map. They'll be out-competed by somebody else and walked out the door. Um, I hope I'm, I'm already doing better today because nobody's walked out the door, so that's great. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, that presentation, that was in September 2008. Okay? And five years later, 2013, Google was a pretty important company. It's even more important today. So what I think that we really have to start thinking about in these areas is how are we going to start as, uh, you know, as, as we brought up at the very, very, very beginning, developing the type of non-discrimination principles that apply to all the big players online. We can't just allow the sort of legacy institutions to dictate what we think is the proper uh, subject of competition or communications law uh, uh, inquiries or investigations or enforcement. We have to have a much more, I think, sophisticated approach looking at the overall online landscape. And that's why I think these ideas that you know, were controversial and, and often panned 10 years ago are now quite high in the policy agenda when we think about some of the problems that are caused by very large intermediaries. Thank you. Uh, well, look, I'm just here really to, I think, make one big point. Well, it seems to me that the cons if you take seriously the concerns that motivate net neutrality, you should actually be far more concerned about discrimination by platforms than discrimination by the carriers. And the reason that I think that should be obviously true is that uh, getting your content noticed is antecedent to having it delivered. It doesn't matter how quickly or how slowly this content is delivered if nobody ever notices it. And I, this struck me at a couple of hearings that we've had in Congress. I'm no longer there, but uh, I, I uh, had some when I was there and also uh, watched a few after. And it seems like the Democrats who are pushing the uh, Save the Internet Act particularly don't seem to notice that there's two sides to this issue, and, or at least there's two components. And again, I think the, the one with the platforms is far more important. So when Chairman Pallone passed his bill recently, he had a series of hearings and a markup. And in his opening statement, he says, in my hometown of Asbury Park, we have this restaurant, and they are telling me that an open internet is very important, and they fear that if there's no net neutrality rules and it's not reinstated, well, then they won't be able to reach their customers because why? Other companies can come in and pay for faster lanes. That's what he said. Now, okay, uh, that may be. But what's the greater concern here? That some of your com uh, 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 com uh, competing restaurants might be able to get their website loaded faster? Or that even though you have an amazing Yelp review, you don't, no one ever notices that your service is outstanding, your food is great, because the platform that hosts all these things or that does the searches actually puts that way down at the bottom and prioritizes its own, con prioritizes its own content. So even allowing that the delivery issue is of somewhat importance, it seems to me obvious that the antecedent issue of getting noticed is first, and that is handled by the platforms. And that comes up again and again. In the hearings on the bill, they brought in a number of people who talked, had some compelling stories about how important the internet is to them. Uh, there was someone from a, the Free Press Organization, I think it was called, that she was talking about particularly for um, marginalized groups, for minorities, it's very important to get their voice heard through uh, the mechanism of the internet. But I keep thinking, and as when you talk about no one else should be able to decide who gets heard, yes, you're absolutely right. But who's really in the position at the first instance to stop you from being heard? It's the platforms. It's not sort of the speed of the delivery. And yes, I know people talk about blocking, you know, outright blocking, yes. If that is done, then yes, you don't get to be heard. But a lot of what we're talking about is sort of throttling or having someone pay for fast lanes. And in that context, the bigger issue, again, to me, is on the platform level. Uh, similarly, they had an actress, uh, actress writer, and she was talking about how she once made some presentation and they didn't want to hear it, and she couldn't get any attention, you know, in early 2000 from sort of the big studios. And now she's become very successful through, uh, I don't know if it's YouTube videos, but basically through online platforms and how essential that is. And she had some really nice uh, uh, phraseology about how important it is to be able to have that access. And I totally agree with her. But I think 
that again, in the first instance, you need to be most worried about not getting noticed, not, get, not the question of, well, I've been noticed, but how quickly is it getting uh, delivered? So that, to me, is sort of the bigger issue. And I, I marvel a bit that that's not getting more attention. And, I, and I, I wish it were. I think that this is a very good discussion to make that happen. So the question is, all right, this is all good and well. What is to be done? Now, the position that the committee took when I was there. You don't like to quote Hoover, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I'm glad you called me. I'm not sure if anyone would. Yeah. Although Chernyshevsky, <laughs> as a scholar, I must say, Chernyshevsky said it before Lenin. But, yes, uh, anyway. You. but anyway, the point is, uh, all right, well, what, what are we going to do about it? So, I, you know, there's various things that, that, that can be done. It could be, you know, re reforms in how we look at First Amendment rights and, and the question of, you know, is a public, what is a public square? What's uh, state action? I mean, my preference personally, uh, I think, is to kind of adhere to the old principles and try to use the levers of antitrust law, as well as potentially revisiting uh, Section 230 to see if there's ways of using uh, uh, those laws, what we already have in the books, without deviating too much from our principles. So uh, on the Section 230, people always mock that and say, well, that's very silly because if you take away the Section 230 protections, then it'll actually make everything worse because then the, the platforms will say, well, you know, if we have no protection, we can't let anything up. Okay, well, that may be true, but they don't want that protection taken away. So you could use it as leverage in the discussion. So, for example, we could take this away unless you make public the grounds on which you may uh, uh, keep content off of your platforms. And if we at least see plainly with greater transparency what is going on behind the scenes, that would be very helpful. And that could be done through that threat. Uh, with respect to antitrust law, there's a lot of discussion now about expanding the lens of, you know, how we look at things. Now, when we did a net neutrality hearing uh, back when I was on committee, I actually did not uh, handle it directly, but I remember that uh, the then ranking member Cicilline said, you know, the problem with antitrust law being the solution here is that it's not robust enough to cover issues, to look at issues like speech and uh, other economic things that might, that should really factor into the analysis of, wh of whether what's being done here is fair. And so you could have something where you're discriminating against certain type of speech that may not meet the consumer welfare standard uh, for an antitrust action, but still is sort of undesirable. So he doesn't seem to think that that's adequate to the task. But the fact is, I think that there have been uh, speeches by Mr. Dal Rahim, who is the head of the, uh, the Assistant Attorney General, the head of the Antitrust uh, Division at the Justice Department, talking about how, no, in fact, there are ways of looking at these things uh, consistent with existing precedent and how we look at consumer welfare and measuring that in objective ways rather than surrendering to more subjective analyses that can still get at some of the things that are bothering us. So I would suggest that the antitrust laws, together with the reexamination of Section 230 are adequate to the task, but we have to be focused on it. And I think we also have to hold the feet to the fire of uh, supporters of net neutrality. Say, listen, if you're, however much you care about this, the greater issue is, is the one of the platforms. And even if you don't agree with that, you should agree that it's at least equal. And so uh, use that to try to bring them into the discussion. And I think that we have tools to stay consistent with our principles and yet deal with what is very clearly a serious issue. So thank you for holding this, and thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you very much. And, and just. Uh, Quick parenthetical uh, before we move on to Adam. Uh, and just, I assume that probably a lot of the folks here are pretty familiar with this issue already, but just in, in broad strokes, Section 230, which we're referring to here, um, essentially holds these companies harmless for uh, most types of content that might appear on, on their services. Think of like a video on YouTube. If I put something defamatory on YouTube, YouTube is not, you know, theoretically at least, liable for that. Um, the interesting thing for somebody like me, who was a practitioner you know, in the industry at the time that this was going on, um, is that there's been a rewriting of history here, in that um, these companies basically built these multi-billion dollar businesses off being able to get away with all sorts of copyrighted stuff, all sorts of you know, defamatory, well, you know, whatever, they just could hold up their hands and say, oh, not our problem, not our fault. Um, and, and they built multi-billion dollar businesses on this. And now that kind of there's a little bit of pressure, they're sort of trying to back away from it and just pretend like, well, if we made it go away, then it's kind of a blank slate. But no, you know, they, they, they have a lot of gains that they've already gotten from this. And I think from a societal perspective, we need to, to pay attention to that uh, in, in terms of whatever the outcome is here and in terms of how we deal with content on these, these services. So uh, Adam, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, Jeremy, for putting this event together. Um, it's, it's a treat to be on a panel with Frank, uh, who I've been reading for years, and his book on the Black Box Society is, is really challenging and, and, and an important book. But 
it's often said you sit on these panels, you look out at the audience, you say, oh, there's so many more people on the audience who you know, know the material better than you do. And sometimes you say it disingenuously, but like, I'm saying it genuinely this time. <laughs> um, uh, this is such a complex area, and people come at it from so many different backgrounds. But it's always a challenge for my sort of perch as a lawyer to come in, or a recovering lawyer, and try to say something useful on this. Um, when I was a lawyer, one of the last cases I worked on was the net neutrality litigation. And I was against net neutrality, the rules then, and I still am. Um, I think that they're a bad policy, um, and I think they, they were in excess of the statutes that were written that the FCC invoked in justifying them. Now, as a former pipeline lawyer, I understand the problems of natural monopoly, and I understand there's a role for public utility litigation, and I understand that you do need to sort of sometimes need to vertically deintegrate these companies to make sure that somebody with the equivalent of a pipeline is enabled to um, corner the market uh, or distort the market on what's going through the pipeline. So I understand that. That's why I take these issues very seriously, even though I disagreed with net neutrality at the time. And I point that's been made already. I, at the time, and I still do recognize the irony that the arguments that were made in favor of net neutrality, right, that, that net neutrality was going to distort the market, it was going to hurt innovation, um, uh, it was going to stifle, it was going to stifle innovation and allow the, the monopolists to extract rents. Um, the irony is those are the same arguments you would make today against things like Google or other edge providers if you see them as monopolies. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad that Jeremy's sort of shining a spotlight on that. I think it's important that people need to take that seriously. If they support net neutrality, I think they do need to think seriously about these things. And it's very hard to say, I think, that Google isn't in, in some ways or in some markets a monopoly, um, at least in its ad market. Of course, what that means for antitrust terms is very difficult, and that's where I'll end up. But let me just say a few words. Um, Jeremy referred earlier to an article I wrote last year called Google.gov. I came up with the title, and I said, i got to write an article. The title's just too good to go to waste. <laughs> um, but the point was that I was concerned about what the future of Google might look like um, and its relationship to policymaking and partisan politics, not because of the usual stuff you think about, like the revolving door um, or lobbying or some of the concerns about what was happening to some of the employees inside of Google. Right? I, was, I was more worried about a, a subtler trend I saw at work, which was basically the intellectual or ideological convergence of the founders of Google and people in the Silicon Valley community with a certain approach to policy making that lent itself to a very particular ideological direction. And basically, the, my thesis was that when the founders of Google look out at the world, they see it as a series of engineering problems to be solved in much the same way that President Obama and Cass Sunstein and sort of proponents of a nudge approach to policy saw the world. I thought that's why Google got along so well, basically, with the Obama administration. And the point of my piece was to say, if you play that out over time, if Google really takes seriously its role in policy and its power to help shape the information that informs policymaking and political debates, we ought to be concerned about this. We ought to think less about sort of a collision, an antitrust collision between the United States and Google, and we ought to think more about sort of a tacit or maybe a more than tacit relationship between Google and certain parts of the, of the policymaking community. That's what the article was about. Um, I, I, I spent a lot of time in that article looking at Google's motto. And I don't mean the don't be evil motto. That's the famous one. It's the less famous model, um, which they've had from the very beginning. They said their goal was, their mission was to organize the world's information and make it use, universally accessible and useful. That sounds like a very objective um, mission. But in fact, it's not. When you think about the terms, to organize the world's information. Well, what counts as information? What counts as disinformation? What's news and what's fake news? Right? How do you make it universally accessible and useful? Right? Useful means you have a, so there's a certain use in mind that sort of presupposes a use, and you're organizing what you deem to be information around that use. And maybe that seems kind of abstract. I don't think it's so abstract, especially now in the aftermath of the 2016 election. When you had Eric Schmidt and you had others saying maybe we should have done more um, maybe we should do more to combat fake news, we should combat disinformation, and so on. I think that's very worrisome and dangerous. And, um, and so that was the point of the article. I didn't offer a policy prescription, and I don't have one. And Sorry, Jeremy, I still don't have one today. I thought really hard, and I'm still coming up empty. Um, the fact that there's a problem to be solved doesn't mean that government is the right people to solve it. Um, and even if there is a role for government to solve a problem, it doesn't mean that the answers are obvious. And what really worries me about the policy moment at this time is that people who are, are focused on this issue um, and they want, to, they want to do something, I worry that they're reaching too quickly to familiar solutions, when in fact what we have is a generational challenge that requires just a bottom-up rethink on what exactly the problem is and what exactly the policy challenges are. And in a way, I think it's kind of like a century ago when the progressives saw um, 
uh, just a world has changed in terms of our communications, our culture, our economic inequality, sectional, like regional differences, and so on. In all these different industries and all these different aspects of American life, there were, asked, there were things that the progressives wanted to solve. And for better or for worse, and I disagree with a lot of what they did, they came up with bottom-up solutions and tried to rethink things. The challenge with the debate we're having on this issue is that everything I just clicked through, um, communications, the economy, um, um, even just things like cultural differences and so on, that's all of those things are wrapped up in the single aspect of technology, right, internet platforms. Right? A century ago, we were having separate but somewhat intellectually related debates about regulation of trade and antitrust and securities markets and aviation and radio communications. Imagine all those debates from a century ago wrapped up into a single industry. That's the generational challenge that we face right now. And so when people ask, what should we do about this? I say, well, don't just do something. Stand there. Right? <laughs> we need to think seriously about this. And I don't think we are. I understand the impulse to go with antitrust, uh, just to pick on, 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 on my, my friend sitting next to me, um, uh, to pick on Daniel's suggestion. The antitrust tool, I worry that that's a little short-sighted. It's familiar, but the fact that there's a move to reorient antitrust away from the consumer welfare standard towards some other kind of public welfare standard indicates to me that actually antitrust isn't the tool we need. It feels kind of like when you're, you need to hammer in a nail and you can't find a hammer, so you grab a screwdriver and you start hammering in the nail with the end of the screwdriver because it, it basically gets the job done. I think that's kind of what antitrust would do here. It might be a proxy for some of the problems we're worried about, but what I really think we need to do, and it's a great challenge for Congress and for scholars like Frank, who have been working on this for so long, is to think of bottom-up solutions, an entirely new regulatory framework, if, in fact, that's what we need. Um, and I think my worry is that if we settle too quickly on familiar policy solutions, we'll be stuck with them for a very long time. You know, the net neutrality debate was a debate over the 1934 Communications Act. And the, I mean, the baby of the conversation was the 96 Telecom Act, so 20 years old. Whatever Congress ends up settling on for a regulatory framework, we're going to be stuck with for decades, if not more. And so that's why I really hope they measure twice and cut once on this. We measure three times. Because whatever they do is going to be what uh, regulatory agencies 50 years from now are going to be invoking to justify regulatory solutions to new problems we can't even conceive yet. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, thanks, Adam. And that's, I mean, that's really terrific. I do think that this is a new toolkit. And, and I actually don't sit before you with my own particular, oh, gosh, this is the solution. I think I, we can identify some problems. I could give some guesses at what I think the solutions are. I do think that we need new tools and that we're not, you know, even the definition of a public square. I mean, your, your talk mentions uh, referenced Buddhism and epistemology, so it got a little bit, uh, you know, abstract from policy in the way a good academic should. That's right. um, but, uh, you know, I think that that really some of these issues, it isn't clear, but I think what is clear kind of to concretize it is that, you know, if Twitter kicks Donald Trump off the platform, that has, that's profoundly political speech and it has political implications. And pretending that we've got some existing tool in our toolbox that can just kind of neatly address that in a check off way, I don't think we do um, without, you know, some new case law or some new laws being written. And so, uh, you know, I think that's, that's the kind of question that we're trying to get out of here is, what might that regime look like? And we do want to be careful that we pick right because we're going to be stuck with it. Yeah. Luther. Sure. Um, Luther Lowe. Uh, I've worked for Yelp for 11 years. And so when I uh, started at Yelp, it was less than 100 people. I uh, got in my car from Arkansas and drove out and started as a low-level uh, person there. And I think part of my impetus for going to San Francisco was uh, general excitement about sort of Web 2.0 and the promise of the Internet. Um, I think the... The rise of, of sort of user-generated content services like Wikipedia and Yelp and, and blogging and what we sort of remember as uh, the Internet being kind of cool uh, a handful of years ago before it became this duopoly, it's hard to decouple that rise from uh, the rise of Google, which, you know, early on presented itself as a turnstile. Uh, there's an infamous interview with Larry Page and, and uh, Sergey Brin in 2004 with Playboy magazine where they describe uh, how they're so much different than uh, MSN or, or AOL or Yahoo at the time because they wanted to get you on our service and out into the web as quickly as possible. And that was really the engine that, that grew the open web and this idea, this ideal that was, 
was sort of the the energy and, and soul of the sort of uh, net neutrality uh, uh, movement, if you will. And so, of course, when I kind of started assuming public policy roles and got an email saying, hey, we've got, you know, 30 other public-facing consumer Internet companies that have signed on to our, uh, you know, save the, save the Internet, uh, org or whatever, uh, are, is, is Yelp signed up? I'm like, hell yeah, we're going to be on that. Well, of course we believe in uh, non-discrimination. Of course there shouldn't be fast lanes and slow lanes on the Internet. But then what we saw is that Google began to change the rules. They, rather than uh, being a turnstile, decided we're, we're going to be a portal. And rather than sending diffusing traffic to the web, uh, as Google grew, it began to siphon more of that traffic to itself. And so we saw that in local search. So if anybody uh, in Washington lives under a rock and doesn't know what Yelp is, if you're doing a, a search for a restaurant or a, or a mechanic or a pediatrician, uh, we've got great uh, uh, user-generated content from consumers who are either warning fellow consumers about uh, you know, a negative experience they've had in the offline world or guiding uh, consumers to a great experience they've had. And so... Uh, what Google does uh, today and what they really begin, what, what they began to do in earnest uh, back in, uh, I guess going back really to, to 2010, 2011 was when it started getting pretty bad, uh, was when you do a search for a pediatrician in, in uh, Mountain View today, rather than steering people to the best information from across the web with rich user-generated content, lots of reviews, uh, from a service, not even Yelp, ZocDoc, RateMDs, HealthGrades, you're instead steered into this Google House product, and you never leave Google.com. And so uh, the effect on the creation of user-generated content, uh, the uh, incentive to innovate and create sort of a Yelp for doctors that's maybe a little bit better, all of that gets decimated. And so we were very active in the 2011 through 2013 uh, investigation of Google uh, at, for a period of time, um, uh, the FTC, part of the reason they opened the investigation uh, and looked at these issues is you could buy an Android phone off a shelf, boot it up, and be reading Yelp reviews with no link back and no uh, uh, attribution in a Google Places app, which is basically sort of cloning all of Yelp's features. And so we participated in these proceedings. Uh, we, we didn't hire any lobbyists or anything. We were very naive about this. Uh, and... Uh, ultimately, we saw uh, not long after, you know, Eric Schmidt said in the Obama war room in uh, uh, election night 2012, uh, you know, a few months later, the FTC uh, decided to close its investigation and uh, not take any kind of meaningful action. And so I, I was just dumbfounded because at the time we were talking to staff, we felt like they understood these issues. Um, and indeed, we learned uh, in 2015 when some of these documents leaked to the Wall Street Journal that many of the staff actually did get it, and uh, they believed that there was some basis to, to uh, take an enforcement action. Um, but basically, I, I thought, you know, how do we educate the EU, which was taking its turn looking at these issues, um, and how do we really hold their hand and walk them through these issues? Because Google was able to effectively uh, say, you know, you know, competition's only a click away, uh, you know, that um, we just want to provide people with answers, and they would point to, like, fact-based information. Like, if I uh, type in 2 plus 2, of course you want to see a 4 on the screen. And then let's just not have a conversation about pediatrician information or whatever. And so that, uh, we, we decided to really think hard about this. And we developed a, uh, a Chrome extension where we showed that it was actually very trivial, technically, for Google to preserve all of its user interface uh, features, the map and the business pins, but actually use its own organic algorithm to power that information. And when you did that, you could actually produce a box. Google calls it the one box or answer box or universal search. These are all Google terms that are interchangeable. But basically, that stuff at the top of the page when you do a local search on Google, it was, it was technically trivial, trivial to power that with information using the entire candidates of the World Wide Web and Google's own organic algorithm. So that's a lot of kind of technical uh, word salad, but the bottom line was what it resulted in is when you did these searches uh, with this uh, Chrome extension plugged in, you would see there were like an order of magnitude more reviews when you read the reviews themselves from ZocDoc and RateMDs and Yelp and other uh, services. Uh, on average, the character links were three times uh, the length, so the quality was higher, there was less spam, there's all this consumer benefit 
that Google was sort of foregoing so it could siphon users to its inferior house product. And so we built this whole demo, and I said, you know what, this is kind of like that net neutrality stuff they were asking me to sign on to a couple years ago. You know, this is non you know, we should just have a non-discrimination principle when it comes to uh, dominant edge services like Google. And so I said, you know, I'm going to try to get a coffee with Tim Wu. He, he might uh, have some advice on how to turn this, get some net neutrality energy behind this idea. And so I was able to finally wrangle uh, Tim Wu for a coffee in New York. I sat down, showed him the demo, and he said, oh, my God, we got it wrong. <clears throat> and I was like, what did you mean we got it wrong? He said, I was the technical advisor uh, for the Federal Trade Commission uh, reviewing the Google matter. And like the day after the Google decision, he had wrote, writ, written an essay in the New Republic saying, you know, Google got off Scott uh, free because they deserve to, because they they benefit consumers. And I said, well, Tim, if you got it wrong, we need to kind of make it right. And so we ultimately worked together on uh, on a paper that uh, showed that uh, basically empirical evidence of, of consumer welfare loss and uh, consumer harm in this uh, in this context. And it turns out local search is the most common thing that we do on Google. It's 40% of all searching uh, today on planet Earth. Uh, two billion human beings will pull out their, their uh, phone and conduct a local search and effectively be mis unwittingly mismatched because of the fast lanes that Google gives itself. Uh, and so, you know, this to me is a, is a really uh, important issue. And so um, I want to talk a little bit briefly about sort of the fast lanes you're, before you're my time. Yeah. Time, so so um, when, you, when you talk about, and, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, and I liked it, is that effectively uh, it is the platform, it is, it is the last thing that that consumer touches that is the ultimate governor of whether that content uh, is, uh, is consumed. And so uh, if you do a local search on a smartphone today, 70% of that traffic stays on Google.com. And this is disturbing because you have, you know, you know during the FTC uh, matter in order to persuade. Do we know what that number was five years ago, by the way? Well, well I was about to get into it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a moving target because basically the rise of smartphones and the uh, increasing ubiquitousness of these devices. In, in 2011, when the FTC opened the investigation, smartphones were relatively nascent, about, you know, somewhere around 30% of Americans have them. Now it's like about 85% of Americans have them. And contrary to Google's claim that this would you know, unleash, uh, that apps were going to unleash a bunch of new competition and Google that, you know, was going to get crushed, kind of like this uh, uh, encounter that you had, uh, it, it actually doubled their uh, size. Like the amount of searching actually doubled. We're searching way more because we've got a search engine right in our pockets. And they're spending, according to, to Goldman this year, $13 billion on the iOS defaults. And, of course, they have the, the defaults on Android, so they've got like a 98% market share on smartphone search, which is the most common way we search now. And so every, all the market conditions, basically one assumes uh, uh, John Lee Woods shut down that case because he'd been persuaded that in a few years the market's going to be more competitive and uh, the entrenched company in question would be less entrenched and there'll be more startups. And that conclusion has not aged well. Everything is far, far worse. And uh, you look no further than sort of the user studies and the data to see how much uh, traffic is ultimately being siphoned and, uh, you know, deprived of. And so, anyway, I think this is a, it's a great discussion because uh, in, in sort of having that conversation with, with Tim Wu when I first met him, I said, listen, um, what do we call this? You know, is this sort of like a net neutrality 2.0 or something? Like, and he's like, well, I don't know about that branding. But, but I did, you know, I think get him to agree that the, this is not a uh, far intellectual bridge to walk across uh, going from non-discrimination principles uh, on edge services or for, for the carriers uh, and going to dominant edge services. So I appreciate you hosting this discussion. Yeah, no, thank you. And it's, it's funny because the, the, the sort of issue of bundling, I mean, this was exactly what we won our case against Microsoft. I and mean, I think technically they settled. But when you settle for a billion dollars, that's, that's a loss, unless you're Microsoft, right? And then it was a rounding error. But, but it was this whole question of, well, if you're essentially bundling things with the operating system, does it give you an unfair competitive advantage? And at least the, the judgment at the time was it does. And I, I, you know, I'm not a lawyer, and I haven't followed the, the most recent case law. But, but I think that logic would still pretty strongly apply in your case. And, and certainly, uh, I've seen myself as a consumer, and I occasionally contribute Yelp content, even although I didn't have a previous relationship with you to this panel. But um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, at 
the Yelp, the Yelp reviews are clearly better than the Google reviews by quite a bit. I mean, a lot of the Google reviews are utter trash, and yet the quick thing that I get when I search is Google. And you know, again, I, I don't know, to, to speak to Adam, I don't know what the exact right tool in the toolbox is, but, but we need to do something about that. So, um, so that's some thoughts. Well, well, thank you guys all for, uh, you know, I'm so used to academics where I was ready to like, be beating you with rulers you know, to keep everybody on time. And as it is, I think we're, we're actually running a fair bit early. Um, so um, why don't I kind of turn over to just a few questions that I uh, you know, wrote of taking the chair's privilege, and then I'll, I'll open it up to, to you guys to ask some questions. Um, you know, Adam, in, in your Google.gov piece, which is a really terrific piece and, and kind of a, a very philosophical piece, and you touched on a little bit of that, you talk about choices based on the right type of facts, right kind of facts. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if you could expand on that for the audience. You sort of touched on that a little bit with nudging, but I think that's a really important point. Um, huh. Well, I was going to start with a joke, but I'll, I'll end with a joke. Um, <laughs> I, I'd say that one of the great debates, and we see it in, in policy today, is sort of a meta debate about the nature of our political disputes. And people say, you're pro-science, you're anti-science, we're part of the fact-based community. You're not. When in fact, what we're talking about so often with policy is a lot of value-laden facts, right? There's a factual question over whether climate change is happening, whether people are contributing to it. The question what the best policy is, that's more of a value choice. And what worries me is we've seen a few times with Google, not so much on search. On search, it's more put its thumb on the scale in favor of its own commercial interests. But we've seen a few times on the advertising side of things where it's put its thumb on the scale of political disputes that it's sort of I don't know why it did what it did, but the fact is, right, it pulled all Internet advertising in the middle of the, the, the Irish abortion referendum, right. a, view, a move that was seen by all sides as, as really favoring one side of the debate over the other based on who wanted to advertise. We saw um, Google uh, kill advertising on payday loans in a the co way that coincided with the Obama administration announcing its, um, its, uh, the CFPB's um, payday loans um, reforms. And in all of this, I mean, Google's a private company. It had every right to do what it was doing under existing law. But it is worrisome that Google, which has such a central role in the information that forms policy, could take such swift and decisive action in ways that could have real policy ramifications. I mean, I, the, the piece, I could go on and put everybody to sleep with some discussion about the fact-value distinction, right? <laughs> Separating facts and values. But like, here's, I'll borrow one of my favorite jokes from one of our colleagues, Harvey Mansfield. He's a senior professor, and he's a famous professor up at Harvard. His dad used to teach at Ohio State, and his, people would ask his father, how many students are here? And he'd say, oh, about one in 10. Right? <laughs> the idea is, is you can ask a question with a very specific sort of factual premise, but words might mean different things to different people. And some people might see sort of a clear-cut fact where others see more of sort of a value judgment. And so I'm very worried anytime somebody says, this policy will be decided on the facts, you start to reach for your political wallet because yeah. you understand that, that sort of Framing policy debates in those terms sometimes occludes more than it reveals, and I worry that Google's tendency is in favor of more of that move, and I think it's dangerous. Yeah, and we're talking a lot about Google today, but I think a lot of these things, and that, that's not by intention, by the way, but just, yeah. uh, I mean, equally apply to Facebook, equally apply to, to Twitter, although they don't quite have the ubiquity in the search business than Google, but I, I see really the identical, or even on Amazon, which has now kicked off 100 plus books from their platform. And, you know, I looked at that list and Gosh, they're pretty objectionable books for the most part, but there's a lot of really, really objectionable books that are still on Amazon, and I'm not really sure that, that I... Can I say something about yeah. that really quick? I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm going to have a whole series of articles, Twitter.gov, Facebook.gov. <laughs> but but the, thing is, the thing is, even in these debates about what should be done, we talk about things like Internet platform companies. Mm -hmm. The fact is the category that we're talking about is so indeterminate, right? Does Facebook and Google, do they have so much in common? that they should be regulated together under the same sort of industry-specific regime? What about Amazon? What about Twitter? I think just the category we're talking about is incredibly hard to define. And even the way we define that category will have will create real path dependence for what policy solutions present themselves. Yeah. Dan, if I could turn to you. You know, you obviously sat on the committees for, for 10 years working on these sorts of issues. What would your kind of other side, uh, the other side, uh, you know, from a partisan perspective, do you think would say kind of to these debates and where, why do you take exception to what you, th I mean, this is now a, a double hypothetical, but, but uh, you know, but why would you take exception? What do you think that they're missing in these discussions? Because, well, you know, they have a logic to them, I'm sure. I think in the first instance, 
particularly with respect to the anti-conservative bias, that's something that a lot of Republicans care about, they would dispute the premise. Right. And they would say it isn't so. And in fact, one of the last hearings we had on the committee featured the CEO of Google. And I actually made a very good joke because he was standing around and some woman called and I picked up the phone and I said, I don't have that information, ma'am, but you can just go online and bing it. And he thought that that was very good. But the point just is that um, at that hearing, uh, then ranking member Nadler said, you know, before we get into this discussion, I think that there's problems of the bigness of, you know, Google, but I want to disabuse us of this notion that there's an anti-conservative bias and this is, there's no evidence of it. And even if there were, they're a private company and this whole thing is basically ridiculous. So uh, they dispute the premise. That's point number one. Mm -hmm. I do think, by the way, that, uh, so, so to answer that particular thing, I don't agree because I think that there is both motive, opportunity, and you know probable cause. So what's motive and opportunity? There was a Wall Street Journal article that said that the Google engineers sat around during the time of the travel ban thinking if they could alter the search results to uh, basically uh, you know protest or otherwise counter the administration's agenda there. And they didn't wind up doing it, according to the article. But the fact that they were contemplating it, again, establishes motive and opportunity. There's a lawsuit by James Damore, who's an engineer there. He alleges all sorts of other things that are going on. I think it seems to me too much evidence out there to simply dismiss. So you know it's not proven beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's silly to dismiss it also. Uh, now. The other things they'll say is that essentially that the focus on consumer welfare is, you know, not fit to the to the current uh, situation in which we live in. And maybe they draw on some of your remarks early on that we really are in a different age here, and we have to have different tools, and that it's too narrow, and that therefore we've got to look beyond into, you know, the the, the political discourse and wages and the environment, and just looking sort of very narrowly, the subjective thing is uh, is inadequate. And the reason I object to that is because I think this is all part of somewhat of a game that's often played on that side where they take an objective, uh, an objective uh, mode of analysis and they say, well, it's imperfect. Therefore, we have to replace it with some subject, subjective, malleable standard that essentially we can control. And that's what I don't like. It's not that I don't agree that there are some shortcomings in the current standard, but I'll always prefer something objective to something subjective, particularly when it's in the hands of the unelected bureaucrats who can then manipulate it. So I think those are the two focuses that they dispute the underlying premise, and then they'd say that you know we're sort of in a new time that requires new tools. Yeah, no, and I think that's that's exactly what we do hear from them. And and you know, kind of continuing on the, the partisan vein, you had something uh, kind of amusing on your Twitter feed uh, just uh, a few days ago that, that I saw that uh, I guess you visited uh, the uh, Hillary kind of election party as a visitor, and that's great. We're ecumenical here at Hoover, so we, we entirely approve of uh, you know, inviting folks who have a wide variety of opinions. But you took a picture with Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, and he was wearing a badge that said staff. Uh, this is at Hillary's election party, 2016. Um, what do you think that that says about the closeness of the relationship uh, between, let's not just pick on Google, but some of these other providers, and, and you know, where, where have you seen that without speaking out of school in, in other kind of areas that you feel like it's been making an impact? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I understand the, the concern by uh, my Republican friends about conservative bias because I agree that the, there are, um, you know, a, as these things uh, leak out, um, I, I mean, the, the TGIF leak uh, that, that came out that, that uh, Breitbart had uh, such a, an amazing scoop on because nobody had ever seen the inside of these, these company all hands meetings. You know, I, I wasn't in that Hillary thing because I... Uh, was a visitor. I, I was a bundler for. I was uh, very, very active on on her race, and and was uh, and was making a joke on Twitter about how I just got a little guest pass, and right. and and you know what do you have to do to be <laughs> listed as staff and have your name on the badge? Uh, I had pretty good access, but I you know I'm sure he was going backstage, but the the and I was pointing out how the next day he was, you know, sitting on a stage at a conference in Manhattan saying we need to congratulate uh, Donald Trump, and ultimately a the, these dominant uh, companies are going to kowtow and suck up to whoever's in power because the, they're they're trying to uh, you know pivot and but uh, I I the thing that going a little bit back to what you know, I was saying I think that the we're there's this frustrating uh, missed opportunity we're seeing is that I see the fears around uh, conservative bias as ultimately kind of. We're, we're reacting to what is a negative externality to bigness, and that there, 
there are lots of Democrats that are legitimately concerned about uh, the potential antitrust violations um, who, you know, might even be open to hearing, uh, you know, novel theories about how this violates the consumer welfare standard uh, before going and ripping up the books. And we're, we're missing those opportunities for sort of bipartisan cooperation because uh, it, you know, in that House Judiciary hearing, it's, it's like it turns into, you know, why are you, why are you censoring, uh, you right. know, conservative voices? And then, uh, and then Ted Lieu feels compelled to, you know, dunk on the conservatives. And you miss this really great opportunity to, for the first time ever, we've got a Google CEO sitting in front of uh, Congress. Uh, and, and it just felt like a missed opportunity to address some of the legitimate business conduct that uh, could uh, result in an enforcement, set, enforcement yeah. action. That this is actually, um, you know, we wouldn't care about the, uh, a giant, like, cosmetics, cosmetics company that was abusing its dominance. Uh, you know, you'd have increased consumer prices and all the ne uh, other negative externalities. It's when you uh, abuse your dominance and you're a giant information firm, uh, that's yeah. when you can kind of monkey with democracy. And so that's uh, why I, I think they're well placed, but ultimately the, the, the vector of attack that we should be, the, the response vector we should be focused on is antitrust questions that build bipartisan consensus. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I plead guilty to being quite concerned and, and occasionally, you know, writing ill-tempered things on Twitter about, uh, you know, conservative bias at Twitter, at Facebook, et cetera, at Google. Um, but I do agree that while that can be a piece of it, we can't lose um, the sort of broader opportunity because there is bipartisan and genuine concern. And that's actually not true on a lot of issues. I think there, but, but this is one of them where people realize the status quo is not acceptable, even though, you know, we have some people who oppose net neutrality, some people who support wishy-washy folks like me in the middle. Um, and, uh, you know, but I do think there's these opportunities. Um, Frank, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Real briefly about that. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to make a quick point about uh, a little behind the scenes uh, fact here. With respect to that hearing, I can attest that the top leadership on the committee went out of its way in even the, the framing of the name of the hearing and in uh, you know, working with the chairman to figure out precisely what he was going to say in his opening statement to try not to go overboard and to focus solely on the conservative bias point, even though that was sort of like the hook for the media and, uh, and you know, a lot of the enthusiasm may be in some of the rank and file, but the chairman and his top staff went out of their way to try to tone that down a bit so as to be able to focus in a bipartisan way on and that. And, and I, will double attest. Out, I will yeah. double attest to that. Yeah. The chairman yeah. was great, but you're right. Some of the rank and file got, it's just, you know. Yeah. But, it's hard. It's yeah, hard because it's, it's out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Frank, if I could ask you, you, you have this interesting part of your platform piece where you talk about, uh, you have this interesting metaphor with Google Glass, and then you talk about Google Goggles, which is not original uh, to you, and you cite the, the guy who originally oh, yeah. men mentions it. But, but you sort of say they, don't, they may not augment reality, but in fact distort bias and render it in a sort of co approved corporate form. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, in the context of this discussion, you know, how does that sort of play out? Um, sure. But, you know, I mean, one of the things that I just wanted to uh, pick up on on some points that Adam and Luther made was that, you know, you think about the, the nudge and the effect. What's fascinating is that in some places it can be quite overwhelming or it can be very strong. In other places, uh, Matt Stoller of the Open Markets Institute says that uh, these large intermediaries are uh, absentee landlords. They're like absentee landlords. And there was this amazing example of this uh, story by Kat Ferguson in The Verge about people looking for opi opi opioid addiction clinics on Google. And they were trying to find ones that would actually help them. Turned out, though, that the entities that would spend the most on marketing were the ones that were spending money on marketing and not on actually taking care of people that needed opioid uh, addiction treatment. They were terrible clinics, but they got to the top of the Google results. Yeah. Then Google said, OK, we're going to be the good corporate citizen. We're not going to accept any paid advertising on these opioid clinic searches. It's going to be all organic. Guess what? You can commodify search engine optimization, and you can be a very bad actor. You can go on and do user-generated content that changes the phone number of legitimate clinics to the ones of the fly-by-night clinics. Okay? So then you have this whole crisis of people sort of being trying to find a legitimate one and then being referred to a bad one. So this is what I think is like really problematic. You know? I mean, and I was reading some stuff by Ben Thompson of Stratechery where he was making fun of the Foundum case in Europe and saying, oh, who would want this you know, comparison site or comment site or whatever? It completely ignores a lot of these very important dynamics about people being utterly misled by the fact that 
an entity has con conquered some of these very important areas, but is not maintaining them properly. And that's why I actually am, I'm, I'm on the opposite side, I guess, of Adam on this point, although I really like your point, your, your, your analysis and your philosophical perspective on it. But I don't think that antitrust is like having a nail and having a hammer and thinking everything's a nail. I think it's like a saw. And we got a saw, you know, Instagram from Facebook, and we're going to saw certain other things away from some of these other companies. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that, you know, that's where ultimately I also wrote another piece for American Affairs um, trying to uh, develop a Hayekian perspective on platforms. And, you know, they, and that's where I said, you know, we, we were going to have some very interesting philosophical debates between centralists and decentralizers. But the, I think the premise for doing anything constructive is going to be knocking some of these companies down to size and at the very least stopping a lot of their acquisitions. Can I piggyback on one thing Frank said? It, I've been saying this the last uh, handful of weeks with all these YouTube stories too. It's like mm -hmm. it, is, it, is, it seems like part of the problem is you, they, they have, there's no question they have dominance in general search. It's that when you leverage that dominance in general search and then you know, take a uh, a, a separate market, a content warehouse of video or a content warehouse of local reviews, which includes opioid clinics, and you staple it to the top, you have no incentive. There's no competitive force within the market for you to uh, administer any kind of quality control. And so that's why you right. get, again, a lot of these negative externalities. Right. And, and you know, furthermore, I'd just, you know, add, you piggybacking uh, on each other. I mean, you're talking about a fact value distinction again mm -hmm. with how you deal with that opioid issue. And, and I think again, living in the Silicon Valley political monoculture, I think it's very obvious to me how my neighbors, who, by the way, are all senior tech execs, almost to a, a man or woman, right, they, they would, like, accept certain things as facts, and I'm not saying that those are necessarily wrong, but they wouldn't necessarily understand that there's a lot of implicit value choices that they're making that, that inform those facts. And so I think that's why we can't simply just let status quo go on, and we've got to treat you know, if we're going to do net neutrality, if we're not, but we got to treat everybody in the same fair way. Not the equal, I mean, not, not the same, but in, in an equal way, I guess I'd put it. And those two things may be um, distinct. Okay, we're now going to open up to questions from the audience. I see we have a, a brave yeah. over here, so go ahead. Drew Clark of broadbandpractice.com. So imagine a two by two matrix, and going across the top, you've got antitrust and prophylactic. Right, uh, and then down the side you've got carriers and edge providers. Okay, so we could do antitrust rules for either carriers and/or edge providers, and clearly they, uh, antitrust rules will apply to both. And that is a good question, but I don't want to ask about that. I want to ask what is the logic of a rule, a prophylactic rule like net neutrality rules for edge providers? What's the legal basis, and what would it even look like? Right. I mean, again, I'm asking you to go into imagine a title. Title One universe, Title Two universe for edge providers, but what would be the basis for it if net neutrality really becomes a live issue on the Hill, in a in a bipartisan way where they dig into it? What is going to be the grounds for putting a Google and a Facebook under the same rules that govern all net neutrality providers? I'll, anybody can take a crack at that. <laughs> the non-lawyer is going to pass on that one for sure. I mean, I can I just, I mean, I, I know this is a little orthogonal to your question, but I really want to, I think it illuminates some of the, the, the developments here. One of the best things that's happened, I think, in contemporary antitrust discourse is uh, people like Lena Khan, the Neil Brandeisian, Sandup Vahesan, who have tried to develop applications of other structural rules that have been applied to other sectors, like the finance sector, insurance, other intermediaries, to big tech companies. Um, and to give one example, and this is something I wrote about, again, like right after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, if you have an intermediary that is taking some giant bite out of transactions, say Apple in the App Store taking 30% or Google taking 30% and not really providing anything approaching a service that is at the value that they're taking out of that, well, you know, we have a great history in this country of dealing with intermediaries that take too much out of a transaction. We have the medical loss ratio in the Affordable Care Act that limits the private insurers from taking certain too much money out of premiums. And we have other sort of rules, tariffs that apply in the communications context. So I think that that's where we have to get a more, bit more creative, is to sort of look back at history and see when we have these very dominant firms, how did we prevent them from getting so much power and using that leverage to basically disadvantage other firms and take too big a bite out of the economic pie? So that's sort of where I come from philosophically on it. There's one other, I mean, not to complicate your matrix, right, but as I've sort of grappled with these things, um, I think in terms of transparency forcing regimes, right? I mean, what, what, a lot of what we described are situations where the consumer the user is getting less than she or he 
thinks they're getting? Are they getting something different than what they think they're getting? Lately, in thinking about possible policy reforms, I think we ought to think harder about what could be done in terms of forcing disclosure and transparency in some of these companies if we think that's what the problem is. Of course, there are problems with the individual privacy interests and other rights of individual users, right? But I think it, the more we could focus, I mean, if we want to borrow from other disclosures, to think about what the SEC does, what other regulators do primarily through disclosure and transparency, helping to educate, not just, well, first of all, to educate users, but also help to empower watchdogs, whether they're profit-seeking watchdogs who want to become, you know, the, 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 the vetters of the vetters, right? The people who would tell you whether Google is doing a better job than Bing or DuckDuckGo on certain things or Yelp. Um, I think we ought to start with transparency forcing mechanisms if we want a policy reform and then go from there to actual breaking up companies or public utility litigation, regulation. Start with transparency. And if I could oh, just you know, go ahead. one little point on that, you know, is I remember like there was this controversy over Comcast using something called Sandvine that was one of, one of these first initial net neutrality controversies because they were slowing some people down using this sort of secretive software that was very hard to detect. It took this guy like several weeks to detect what was actually going on online. And, you know, I would, I, in some of my earlier pieces, I compared that to the Foundum case in Europe where the people that ultimately are the, the litigants that, you know, led to the big, Vestager's big move against Google in Europe, they just couldn't understand why all of a sudden their site that used to be able to buy ads at five pence, suddenly it was five pounds, right? And they were like, what, what went on here? And it was just unclear. And so that is totally right. I, I totally agree with Adam about the transparency point. Yeah, and you mentioned also, Adam, privacy, which we haven't talked enough about, but, but privacy and data ownership. I think those, these are huge issues, right? Like the fact that I could build up, I mean, let's ignore sort of you know, false claims or, or deceptive business practices. We haven't really talked about that very much. But that I could build up a million Twitter followers and then Twitter kicks me off the platform, that itself is problematic. But I don't have any ownership of this business effectively that I've built. And so again, I think we need to think about what sort of regime, the new legal regime we might have in place or whether we can maybe address it with the existing regime. I'm not saying we can't. Yeah. It's, it's, I would say it's really funny, you see the companies talk, they say we'll protect your data. But in fact, they don't really see it as your data. Yeah. It's their data that you've given yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's not sustainable. Yeah. I mean, and I, I agree with you. Yeah. That's, uh, you have a new. Um, to what extent should we, this is, a Hi. this is a tricky question, so I hope I articulate it correctly. To what extent should we account for the level of effort that users have to take in the consumer welfare standard? So for instance, I can just scroll down the Google page, or I can go to the next page, or, you know, whereas when it comes to choosing my wireline provider, I don't have a choice no matter how much effort I put in unless I move, right? Is there any consideration in the community about whether that counts or whether we should account for that? Does, does that make sense, that question? I can take a stab at it. I mean, I think you just, the advantage of online platforms is that there, it's an information feedback loop, and so you can either subpoena or, and what we've shown in, you know, what Yelp has shown in the EU is actually pretty much any Joe can walk from the, can walk off the street and understand what's happening under Google's hood with uh, me, uh, using Mechanical Turk user testing. And, uh, you know, it, it, it does, if, is an alternative actually available if, you know, less than 2% of people uh, utilize it? I mean, that to me suggests that there is some type of cognitive cost uh, that is not being uh, um, sort of calculated into the, the analysis of uh, the firm's dominance. You can't just say these are these hypothetical, there's these hypothetical choices available. If, if nobody's using them, then, you know, if, if uh, you know, why does, if competition is only cl a click away, you know, they're, they're not taking any chances spending $13 billion a year on defaults uh, for the iPhones. So, Frank, you, you opened this by talking about your paper in 2008 where you said uh, you were challenged that Google will be dead in a couple of years and gone. But there were a number of businesses in 2008 that everyone thought was going to be the next winner of everything that are dead and gone. Back in the 1960s, the big three were 90% of the market, and now they're clearly not. Throughout history, we've seen dominant players become not dominant players through not government action, but robust competition. Are we just being myopic in our analysis here and just seeing only a smidgen of time and not really thinking more broadly about the history of all businesses, which both have rises and falls? I mean, I, I do think that there are, 
I think the problem is that we have to, uh, I mean, in the long run, as Keynes said, you know, in the long run, we're all dead in a way. So, you know, we, we could say in the very long run, sure, and I can imagine that there's going to be some, somebody that's going to displace these very large firms. But in the meantime, you know, for a lot of people are being damaged by them. You know, a lot of people are being deterred from investing in, say, these, you know, people that could be rising up or young venture capitalists, et cetera. And those are some of the people I talk about in Chapter 3 in the Black Box Society. And so I think that, you know, the other side of it, I guess, is that I think that there are, um, yeah, can I, at some point, what's necessary is a sense that after a given number of years, you start being very concerned about sort of a durably entrenched uh, monopoly or dominant provider. And I think we've really reached that with a lot of these entities. Um, I guess the final point I would make, though, is that this gets to the um, consumer welfare points that were made earlier, you know, about the suitability of the consumer welfare standard. There's a great English uh, uh, or Oxford um, antitrust professor, competition law professor, Ariel Zrahi, and he writes, uh, wrote this article called Sponge. <laughs> the whole idea of the sponge is that antitrust law around the world, competition law, it isn't just about sort of short-term, fast, consumer welfare, whatever is the cheapest, the quickest, the fastest right now, it thinks about broader societal values about how we want to shape our economy. And I think what I've been hearing you know, from all the panelists today are some very grave concerns that we may be sleepwalking into a scenario where we're giving just way too much power to certain very large firms, and we've got to rethink that. And you know, just to give one last example of you know, where this could go, I highly recommend looking at Max Tegmark's uh, book, uh, like future, uh, on, on the Future, uh, he's a futurist of Silicon Valley, he's really popular there, where he talks about openly about the possibility of tech platforms being so large that they can influence politics and the web, and that, that never being discussed, you know, right. and never being discovered. And I think when you've got sort of futurists that can openly write plausible uh, scenarios where they own so much of the media that they can basically sort of push things in their direction uh, around the world, that's a pretty troubling reality that we face right now. Uh, and Robert Epstein's work, if you're familiar with that, I mean, suggests, and you know, again, there are critiques and, and people who su support it, but I mean, it suggests that actually that, that effect is very large and it's happening right now. Um, so I think these are not simply hypotheticals. Uh, hey, so I had another uh, antitrust question. Uh, I wanted to discuss just the, the intersection of sort of anti-competitive practices and viewpoint discrimination. Uh, if you had a situation where uh, a company, Google or one of these, were to exclude a search result, or endorse a boycott, or uh, exclude uh, certain platforms from their own uh, app distribution services uh, in a way that, if evaluated purely economically, would be clearly anti-competitive, but has a political justification in itself, whether it's battling hate speech, or um, uh, fighting fake news, or even to influence a political election to ignore campaign finance law for a moment. Uh, is that a viable defense against uh, antitrust action? and? Uh, if so, is there a, um, either through rulemaking or litigation, is there a clear path to separating the two or distinguishing the two? I mean, just, just thinking about this, you know, it's a concept of, uh, it really is helpful to go back to a couple of Supreme Court cases uh, from the, one's from 45 and one's from 1951, but the one's the U.S. versus AP and the other is uh, U.S. or there's a, it involves the Lorraine Journal, UNV versus Lorraine Journal. And both of those cases really do think seriously about the compatibility of the First Amendment and antitrust actions with respect to the media. And I think that, yeah, there, we do have to be sensitive there in treading ground here to make sure that there's no uh, politicization of that process whereby the government is using the antitrust law to retaliate against some entity that it doesn't like its political views. But in both of those cases, the Supreme Court was quite strongly uh, behind the application of antitrust law and actually said it was pro-First Amendment when it's simply based on a commercial concern that very dominant commercial players are structuring a communicative environment to systematically disadvantage their own rivals. Well, I guess, and briefly, going back a bit to your question about you know, the legal basis and how would something look if you went after the edge providers, that this is uh, an addition to your point, that if you try to impose a regulatory framework on uh, platforms to say that they have to, say, uh, not discriminate and do various things, then they could potentially raise a First Amendment defense. And so then you'd run into that, would it be, and, and it's possible that they could prevail on that depending on how they're uh, classified, whether they're utility, whether they're considered a, uh, a marketplace, whether they're private. So uh, I think that you have to think about all these issues uh, on both sides of it. A, you know, do they have First Amendment rights? And then if they do, 
uh, is that a defense to us trying to regulate? Um, I'm pleased to see Alan Bakari here, who has broken a number of these uh, interesting tech stories. So I'll let uh, Alan take a, a question, if we could. Uh, first of all, great uh, discussion. And uh, it might interest you to know that Facebook, while you guys were talking, just banned a number of high-profile commentators, uh, <laughs> some of them very controversial, but just highlights the urgency of this topic and uh, this panel. Was Jeremy um, among them? <laughs> I, I, I don't believe so. I believe Paul Joseph Watson was in a number oh of other goodness. figures. Yeah. Um, but anyway, my question is actually about uh, transparency. So we know that uh, Google uh, doesn't tell us some things. At the congressional hearing, Sundar Pichai said that uh, Google doesn't manually intervene in search results. Uh, a month later, we got uh, an inside scoop revealing that they do intervene in search results and around specifically political topics as well. So I was wondering what the panel thought about um, what sort of transparency we'd like to see from these companies, uh, what sort of things could be made transparent, and how it would get around their arguments that uh, it would in infringe on their propriety technology. At the risk of sounding uh, too sympathetic to, uh, to Google, I do think that uh, I, I am somewhat defensive of it. There are, what we were able to show in our uh, antitrust complaint in Europe is that intrinsic, there's sort of this meta point that intrinsic to Google's search uh, itself, there are uh, tools that you can use to gauge uh, uh, transparently how Google weighs particular pages. And by that I mean you can basically add a Boolean query. You can say, you know, if I'm doing a search for, uh, you know, uh, Google TGIF, I can add a open parentheses, site colon, nytimes.com, or statement, site colon, breitbart.com, close parentheses, and I would expect to see Breitbart uh, higher up because they broke the, you broke the TGIF. And so that's a, uh, you know, that's one way of, of doing that. And there is, there are, like, if, if you were to kind of point that uh, at Yelp and say, hey, should Yelp be more transparent, there are efforts uh, by spammers to bait, who are hell-bent on misleading consumers who are trying to basically uh, astroturf their pages and write tons of fake five-star reviews. We have to have certain things that are ambiguous or else they can do that. But uh, it, it does get trickier with these subjective political things when you have kind of one-off uh, blacklisting. So I'm not, I don't have like a clean answer to that. Um, so I think I'm getting various motions from the back of the room that I think Senator Hawley has arrived, although I don't see him here, but I think he will hopefully be emerging from the, uh, the side door, perhaps, or the back door. Uh, so if he is here, I think we'll go get started with, uh, with uh, the next stage with this fascinating panel discussion. Thank you guys so much uh, for coming, and thank you to the audience as well. Uh, normally, we would do a, a big, flashy intro uh, for a United States senator, but I think everyone here knows who Senator Hawley is. Uh, he was raised in rural Lexington, Missouri, and I should note he's a Stanford graduate with highest honors, so it's a little bit of a homecoming to have him here at uh, Stan one of Stanford's DC outposts. Um, uh, and he also attended Yale Law and was a Supreme Court clerk for Just Chief Justice Rogers, uh, Roberts, excuse me, as was his similarly underachieving wife, Erin Morrow Holly. Um, uh, after several years as an Apple lit litigator, he returned to Missouri as a professor at the University of Missouri Law School and then was elected Attorney General. Uh, of Missouri, and in 2018, he was elected to the United States Senate from Missouri, uh, and has really made a name for himself in this issue in his first year in the Senate. And I would say it's extraordinarily unusual for a first-term senator to come in and so immediately own uh, an issue, as I think Senator Hawley really has done on this in his, his uh, first year in the Senate. Uh, and those of us who are really concerned about the power of big tech are, have been looking to him for leadership. Um, and my initial encounter with him, just really briefly, because I want to turn the thing over to him, um, I had written a piece in The Federalist on some of these issues that we're talking about today, and I got a call a couple days later from Jefferson City, Missouri, and I said, well, I don't know anybody from Jefferson City, so that went to voicemail. And sure enough, uh, who was it on the other end of the line on my voicemail but Senator-elect Hawley? And he wanted to talk, and we spent about an hour on the phone kind of going over these issues, and uh, he was obviously both very well informed for some of the things he'd already done in Missouri, but very interested in learning more. And I said, you know, normally, Senator, uh, I would just do a one-pager for a senator. But I know you're a former Supreme Court clerk, so you're used to drinking through the fire hose. Uh, so I'm going to go take the, the liberty of I put about 60 articles from me and some of my friends, probably two or 300 pages of material, and I just sent it his way. And uh, sure enough, you know, a few weeks later in Congress, it seemed, I don't know whether this is great skimming skills from your law school days or Supreme Court days, but he'd sort of assimilated all that information and was uh, more fluent in it than I was at that point. Um, and so we're really delighted to have him here with us today. 
Um, he's been a real trailblazer in fighting for the free and open internet, and we're looking forward to hearing his remarks and seeing his continued leadership here uh, on these issues in the U.S. Senate. Please join me in giving me a warm welcome to Senator Josh Hawley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. It's great to be here. Uh, it's always good to be uh, back, at least in spirit, at Stanford and here at the Hoover Institution. Hoover was really a, a lifeline for me when I was a Stanford undergraduate. I loved my, my time there. It's great to have Stanford over my so shoulder, at least uh, digitally. And uh, it, it's not, you know, I took it as a compliment when Jeremy actually sent me real reading and didn't just give me the, the, uh, the Senate one-pager. You know, I noticed since that I've become a United States senator, once upon a time I was, I was a practicing lawyer, I was a constitutional lawyer, I was a law professor for a while, and I used to get invited places to give real substantive speeches and to talk about real things like I hope we're going to do today. But I've noticed since I've running for office and, and being in office, now I get asked to talk about, you know, these, I'm not trusted with, with weighty subjects any longer. I mean, now it's sort of, you know, would you come and talk about uh, the life of a public official, you know, as opposed to anything substantive. So it's a real delight to be here today. I'll tell you a funny story about being, I'm not only a freshman senator, I am the youngest senator of either party. Before I stepped up to the podium here, I took off my Senate pin, which is a little a little piece of jewelry that I frankly detest. And when I first got it, I said, uh, I'm never going to wear this. And so I handed it to my staff. And they said, we really think you'll want this, Senator. And I said, I don't want it. I think it's pretentious. I think it looks silly. I don't, I'm, I don't wear pen. I'm not doing that. So then I went to vote. My first vote, I walk up to the, uh, to the chamber. And the security guards who stand there doing their job stop, put out their hands, stop me. And they said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going on the floor to vote. They said, where's your pass? And I said, well, I don't, I don't, uh, I said, I don't, I don't, I don't think I need a pass. I'm not, I'm not staff. And they said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm the senator. And they said, where's your pen? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm really, I am. I'm the United States senator from Missouri. I had to go dig out the pen. I was subsequently stopped on the, on the subway that runs back and forth. I've been stopped multiple times. So I finally relented. I'm wearing the pen when I'm in the United States Senate, but not with you here today. So it's, it's great to be here and among friends. And I, I want to thank the Hoover Institution again for inviting me to speak on this important subject. I want to focus your attention on the, on the brief time that we have together on the issue of social media in particular. And social media is, a, is challenging for us to grapple with because it presents so many novel problems, as you well know. And none of them seem to admit of easy answers. In many ways, our in, the internal tensions of our goals seem irreconcilable. I mean, how do we preserve online data privacy for users of products whose very purpose is hyper-personalized service? Or how is it possible for big tech platforms to keep the digital public square pruned, if you like, and free of criminal activity or other vices without inserting their own political or content biases into the editorializing that they're doing. What does competition even look like in this space? I mean, that's a, a really, really tough question. What does competition look like? I mean, after all, the supposed value of this space to consumers is a kind of integration. It's an integration of various services and various platforms, various lines of business, all in one place. And these, of course, are very important questions. They are much the questions of the day on Capitol Hill. I have my views on each of them, and they are rightly the subject of, of a quite serious debate, and I hope that debate will continue and extend. But I want to suggest to you today that, in a sense, all of those questions are downstream of a larger one, a bigger question which I think we ought to be devoting more time to as a society, and I want to talk with you about briefly this afternoon. And that is the question of the worth of these social media platforms and the social media business model to begin with. What is its actual worth to the American economy and to American society? I mean, one of the most difficult things about acting in this area is the fear that any significant change in this space, any significant adjustment to the rules of the road, whether it be privacy requirements or content requirements, might end up stifling Silicon Valley, which we are accustomed to regarding, certainly we're told, as the great crown jewel of the American economy. But is it? Is it? It's heresy to say that here with Stanford University over my shoulder, but is Silicon Valley, the platforms, the products, the business models that it has been giving us of late, is this really the best that our best minds have to offer? And I won't hide my thesis from you. My thesis is I think the evidence is more and more strongly suggesting that there is something that is deeply troubling, maybe even deeply wrong, 
with the entire social media economy. That it does not represent a source of strength for America's tomorrow, but is rather a source of peril. Consider for a moment the basic business model of the dominant social media platforms. You're familiar with them. You might think of it as akin to financial arbitrage. Maybe we'll call it attention arbitrage. Users' attention is bought by the tech giants and then immediately sold to advertisers for the highest price, of course. Now, arbitrage opportunities, as those of you familiar with markets know, are supposed to close, right? I mean, the market eventually determines that something is off. How is it that this attention arbitrage in the social media market is preserved and renewed over and over again? And that's where things get really, really scary because it's preserved by hijacking users' neural circuitry to prevent rational decision-making about what to click and how to spend time. Or just to simplify that a little bit, it's preserved through addiction. Social media only works as a business model, anyway, if it consumes users' time and attention day after day after day. It needs to replace the various activities we did perfectly well without social media for the entire known history of the human race with, it, with itself. It needs to replace those activities with time spent on social media so that addiction is actually the point. That's what social media shareholders are investing in. They are investing in the addiction of users. And I think that social media users actually understand this intuitively, even if they would put it a bit differently. You don't log on to Facebook to connect with a friend when you can just as easily call him or shoot her a text with your phone. You don't log on to find an article that you've been meaning to read when you could just as easily go and find that specific article yourself using a service or a platform that's designed to do that. Now, you log on to Facebook to be on Facebook. The attention arbitrage market itself becomes the destination. And we all know the effects. Our attention spans have dulled. Our tempers have quickened. We reduce our friends to their public presentation in short posts. We substitute comments and likes for phone calls and direct human interaction. And those are the benign effects. Day after day, it seems, brings fresh data, fresh reports, fresh studies, detailing the significant social consequences of social media use in such large quantities. Today's Washington Post, for instance, I don't know if you've seen it, has a chilling story about the rash of teenage suicide, especially in younger teenagers. Reporters walk through the evidence here. They, they, they trace uh, the researchers' attempt to, to isolate what is driving this surge in teen suicide. They tried various theories mapped on to, to various events in society, and eventually what they discovered was the uptick, the, it's not just an uptick, it's a surge in, in teenage suicide, particularly among younger teenagers, coincides eerily with the introduction of the iPhone, particularly in its later models, uh, which, which made, uh, uh, where the social media platforms and the social media apps were readily available and optimized for use. Now, it could just be correlation, not causation. But as I say, day after day brings new studies that strongly suggest, strongly suggest that there is a significant correlation, if not a causal relationship, between growing social media presence, between the uh, avalanche of social media usage, and these terrible social consequences. Depression is another example. We're struggling society-wide with an epidemic of teenage depression and rising depression rates among young adults and older Americans, for that matter, too. And again, many studies now suggest that the time spent on social media and on social media platforms at least correlates to some degree with increased depression, loneliness. All of these social consequences, these are significant. You might even say that they are severe. And the question we need to be asking is, what is the role of social media in driving them? in encouraging them, in promoting them. And is this really something that is good for our society in the long term, or for our economy for that matter? While we're talking about the economy, think for a second about the opportunity cost that this social media business model and these social media platforms, which you might call the social media economy, think what it presents. This is what some of our brightest minds have been doing with their time for years now, designing these platforms, designing apps that integrate with them, I mean, what else might they have been doing? 
just think about it. What, what else might these bright minds, these talented women and men have been doing that might have been truly productive for the American economy and for American consumers? We've encouraged an entire generation of our bright engineers in a discipline that provides little or no productive value to the United States economy, sucking them from communities that need their talents out to outposts on the coast, encouraging them to forget the problems of the people that they left behind. And of course, capital then follows them to those places. These are economic developments that reward some, there's no doubt about that, but attention arbitrage, like financial arbitrage, is no foundation for long-term growth. And that's my thesis to you today. You know, the most frightening thought of all of this is that the social media platforms might come to define our future economy. A social media economy. Imagine that. An economy that does not value the things that matter produces a society that is shaped in its own image. That, I want to suggest to you, is something that we cannot afford. It is something that we cannot allow. And it is within our power to change it. And that is the great challenge and task of our time. So to conclude, I, I want to say thank you again to Hoover for having me and for, for hosting this very important conversation. And I think it is incumbent upon all of us as we consider the place that we're in now, as we consider the new era that we're living in, particularly those of us who believe in free markets, who believe in the free and open economy, to be asking ourselves, what kind of an economy are we encouraging? What kind of a society is that producing? And what is our responsibility, all of us, as members of that society, to shape it in the best way for the future? Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. you no, know, yeah, so, so you've laid out a couple of really great examples of uh, the issues that social media presents for us. And I'm wondering, like, in tackling these issues, what's the best way to be thinking about it? I mean, you have people saying, uh, we need to approach this from a consumer privacy um, kind of, you know, consumer protection issue or... Uh, you know, using the antitrust laws, or you could uh, use the antitrust laws to talk about, um, you know, splitting up companies or whatever else. I mean, are you approaching it? For, and there's new legislation, obviously, on the floor. So what's the best way to think about really tackling all these issues that you've presented today? Well, I don't think that there's any one right approach. And the, the, the scope of the, of the policy areas that you've just mentioned uh, in your question, I think, suggests just how big a problem this is and just how pervasive an influence social media is. Um, certainly, there are, there are antitrust questions. I mean, look, as Attorney General of Missouri, which is what I did before I was elected to the Senate, I launched the country's first investigation at the state level of uh, Google. And it was multifaceted. I mean, we looked at Missouri has quite robust antitrust laws, actually. So we looked at uh, the, the investigation was predicated on potential violations of antitrust, on potential associated anti-competitive behavior, on consumer uh, welfare uh, and uh, consumer protection issues, and also privacy. You know, those are related but different concerns. And so Google alone, let alone these other social media platforms, touches all of those. So I think we can't, I think there's no one correct way to proceed. I think we need to look across the waterfront. I think we should not be hasty uh, in what we do. Um, I think that we should not uh, barrel forth without, we need to have a robust discussion. But I, for one, think that uh, one place where we ought to be able to begin immediately is on privacy considerations as it relates to children. And I've introduced legislation. It's bipartisan legislation. It's the first major piece of child privacy online legislation in over 20 years. And it would prevent online tracking of children. It would prevent advertisements directed towards children. And it would give parents, on behalf of their minor children up to age 15, a right to have their data deleted. It's the, the so-called eraser button, is what we like to call it. I think this is a great place to begin, and I hope that it will indeed pass uh, this Congress this year um, and, uh, and be enacted into law, and I think we, we ought to be looking at things like that. I want to say, as a, to go back to markets for a moment, as a free market guy myself, I think it's important that the steps that we take be truly pro-market and pro-competitive. I mean, we, we need our free markets to be open and fair and to be functioning well. One of the things that concerns me most 
about uh, the current climate of Silicon Valley is I'm not sure how competitive it actually is. But whether we're pursuing competition or whether, uh, sorry, whether we're pursuing privacy um, or whether we're pursuing, we're talking about uh, biases and, and uh, uh, deep platforming, whatever it is we do, I think it needs to be competition reinforcing. We want our markets to function. We want to promote innovation. We want to promote new entries into the market. So all of that, I think, has to be a, a major concern and has to, um, has to be very much a part of what we're doing. It's a great question. Yes, sir. So just uh, Drew Clark with broadbandbreakfast.com. Just building on that last question, could you say It's a great name, broadbandbreakfast.com. I love Th it. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Uh, just so building on this last question, could you speak specifically at Section 230? There's been a lot of discussion about reforms or eliminating it entirely. What, what is your position at this moment and in your role on the Judiciary Committee? I mean, do you see that as something that uh, you know, could be addressed in the short term? Well, uh, I think we need to we need to look at Section 230. I think we need to consider uh, whether Section 230, as it's currently written, is is functioning well, and whether it is giving us the outcomes uh, that it was intended to give. You know, Section 230. Um, I don't need to explain to you. I mean, it, it is obviously a tremendous benefit uh, to those um, who can take um, take advantage of it, um, but it is predicated on those media platforms who, who are covered by 230 on them providing open, fair, free platform for the exchange of ideas. Now, if they're not going to do that, if they're going to insert their own, for example, political biases into their editorial work, then they start to look a lot more like a traditional newspaper or a television station or other forms of media that we're quite familiar with but who don't qualify for 230 immunity. So I think we need to, to ask ourselves, how is 230 really functioning now uh, in the world of these dominant social media platforms? But whatever we do there and however we proceed, I think we need to be careful to make sure that it, it is not an incumbency measure, that it doesn't just benefit the dominant companies and further entrench them. This is a big concern of mine across the waterfront here, to go back to the previous question. In whatever steps Congress takes or other enforcement bodies, I think we've got to be very attentive to not ha having those become just a matter of entrenchment of, uh, of existing platforms, because we have a competition problem, I think. Uh, and that's certainly in the 230 context, I would want to be very, very careful to make sure that new and smaller platforms are able to enter the market and are not at such a severe disadvantage uh, that they would have uh, no chance of ever competing and establishing themselves. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for answering our serious questions as opposed to your personal and lightweight speeches. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I teach at University of Virginia as well as in Chinese University of Hong Kong every year. And I'm really struck by your comment. I had another question, but I'm going to ask this one instead, which is much broader. Uh, I'm struck by your comment that Silicon Valley may not be the best that we have to offer. In today's uh, hegemonic rivalry between us and, and China, um, Silicon Valley is one of our most important national security advantage. And I know that because at UVA and in Hong Kong and in Beijing, all of my best students want to go to Silicon Valley, even those in Beijing. So uh, what you're saying, I'm asking the question of, I thought we were coming here to talk about net neutrality. Are you saying that we should revamp our entire system in Silicon Valley, the venture capital, the education system? Or are we here to talk about sort of tweaking it to make it more competitive? Well, I would say, first of all, it, it's not so much that I don't know that Silicon Valley um, uh, it represents the best and the brightest, but what is it Silicon Valley? Although I will say, I mean, let me just be on record as saying, I, I, I don't believe in this sort of Silicon Valley worship. Uh, that says that, that, that it is unquestionably the very best of American society. But I actually don't believe that at all. I don't think that's true. My question is, what has Silicon Valley been producing for the American economy and American society in recent years? And, and that, I think, is, is I mean, you've, you've heard my thoughts on that. I think we need to question whether they're actually giving us the best and whether the, the uh, investment of their time and talent, our engineers, our software designers, our scientists, whether it's really being put towards truly socially and economically productive use. I do question that. However, let me come back to something else you said about national security. I'm delighted you raised this. You said that, national, that Silicon Valley is a national security advantage. Is it? Is it? It's not clear to me that it is. Silicon Valley is, uh, let's, I mean, let's, let's, be, let's be frank. What is it that Silicon Valley is most interested in? Making money. I mean, right? That's what they do. They're businesses. That's fine. However, Silicon Valley is now dominated by corporations 
that are multinational corporations who are only incidentally located in the United States. They don't view themselves as American corporations. They don't seem to exhibit any particular interest in or loyalty to the United States of America. Their interest is in their bottom line, their global bottom line, and they're happy to turn a profit wherever they may turn it. And their investment in China in particular, I think, is particularly worrisome. Because the Chinese economy, we know that investments made in the Chinese economy do not just stay in the Chinese economy. They inevitably flow to the Chinese military and to the repressive Chinese government and are used to build an authoritarian state the likes of which this world has never seen before. I mean, you talk about, forget surveillance capitalism. I mean, surveillance communism is truly, truly startling. I think to a degree that, that most Americans have no idea. And we are in a, a new era of great power competition, and I am deeply concerned about the position of Silicon Valley in that competition. Now, look, I'm not saying that, our, that uh, these companies that are based in the United States should be forced to help uh, the United States military or forced to cooperate with DOD. I don't think that at all. But they, they don't have. But what I do think is they need to be very clear that their investments – partnerships, cooperation with China cannot be truly benign. I mean, it, it, is not, it, it does not simply benefit the Chinese consumer. And my own view is, is I doubt these companies are terribly concerned about the Chinese consumer. I think they're probably more concerned about their profit margins. But it's not just to benefit the Chinese consumer. It benefits a repressive Chinese regime and a Chinese military. You know, our, our Joint Chiefs of Staff have, really, uh, have recently been quite forceful on this topic. I think this is a discussion that, that we need to have. Um, and that we need to hear more about, uh, because uh, I, I'm very, very concerned um, about uh, about the trend lines here. Thank you for raising it. That's a very last, important question. Last question. Oh, I'm going to let you choose, since it's the last question. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Yes, uh, sir. Carl Zabo with Net Choice Center. I'm very glad that you're in Congress, and, and very happy that you're here. I, like you, am about free markets and limited governments. Do you see a way to address some of the problems that you see through not through government action, but through the free market and limited government solutions? And if so, how should we do that? Well, I, yes. I mean, I hope so. I mean, look, markets are, markets are the creation. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Markets are the creation of the rule of law. You've got to have the rule of law in order for a market to function. Right? And this is, a, this is why conservatives, sometimes to a fault, uh, talk about property rights. You know, we talk about assigning rights to folks, you know, usually on the basis of some sort of value created, right? But we talk about assigning property rights to folks, having there be clear lines of assignment and then trade so that a market can function. That's how you stand up a market. I think part of the challenge we have now is this is a market, this, the social media market, the, the, the tech market is a market that is, is so new to us that our law hasn't kept up and we're even having trouble conceptualizing what, for instance, do property rights look like. So take the, take user's data. You know, I mean, I guess it's all familiar to, to you in this room. In the last 10 years, say, the, the, the look and, and interface and feel of, say, Gmail to the average American consumer, I mean, it really hasn't changed that much. I don't mean that as a slam on Google. I'm sure it works beautifully. But in terms of how it, the consumer-facing portion of Gmail looks and operates about the same as it did, did 10 years ago. However, the business model behind Gmail has arguably changed quite significantly in that the amount of data that Google extracts from users in order to make Gmail free has changed significantly. So most American consumers think, because they're told, that the products that they use, whether it's the social media platforms or these other online products, are free. But the, but you know they're not really they're not free. They're not they're not free at all. So this is just one example of of an area in which you might ask: Is the market really well functioning when consumers don't know what's actually being taken from them? don't have any way to meaningfully to prevent it or to get it back, can there really be a, a true buying and selling with the transparency that's necessary for a free opening and functioning market? I'm not sure that there is. So I see the challenge before us, not in terms of we need to impose a whole bunch of regulation to tweak stuff in the economy. It, it should be, we should be viewing this through the lens of market reinforcement. What do we need to do in order to make the market function in a way that is free, fair, and open? What do we need to do to make it function in a way that is healthy um, and that is sustainable on the long term? And I think that these are difficult questions. That's why they don't, to go back to the first question, that's why there is no one answer, oh, this is the thing to do. But we, we do need to look across the waterfront, and we need to have in the midst of all of that, and this is my, I'll come back to the, my point today to you, we need to have in the midst of that a broader conversation about whether or not these business models and social media platforms in particular are truly beneficial to us economically 
or socially. Not so that we ban them, but so that we as a because we can decide, as this is the beauty of a free market, we can decide to what we give our attention, our dollars, our time. We need to have a conversation about this and decide, is this really what we want our economy to look like? Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.